Hello and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord, and today we want you to come with us on a pilgrimage to the land of our Catholic roots, Catholic Rome. In the holy year of 1975, 2,000 couples belonging to Marriage Encounter went to Rome. And when they returned, one in particular, Jerry and Judy, told us of their experience, how it felt to step on the grounds of Vatican City, our country within a country, how it felt to stand on the ground that 2,000 years of succession have been there, our popes, one after the other, rubbing elbows with Catholics of every color and creed, speaking every language under the sun. Today we want to bring you with us as we share those beautiful gifts that the Lord has given us in this, the land of our heritage. We are steeped mm -hmm. in our Catholic faith. We are proud to be Catholics here in the city of Rome. So come with us now as we share with you this very special place, our Rome. Stay with us. We love you. They say that all roads lead to Rome. For us Catholics, all roads lead to St. Peter's Basilica and Vatican City, the heart of Christianity, the roots of our church, built over the tomb where our first Pope, Peter, was crucified upside down. Since the Middle Ages, there has been a tradition in our church to come to Rome to celebrate a holy year every 25 years. In 1983, Pope John Paul II instituted a very special holy year in honor of the 1950th anniversary of the death of our Lord Jesus and gave holy year indulgences all over the world. It was a beautiful, faith-filled event, especially for anyone who had never experienced the holy year. The next holy year will be in the year 2000. St. Peter's Basilica has been, until recently, the largest church in the world. But St. Peter's will always be steeped in the traditions of our church. Inspired works of Michelangelo can be seen throughout the church. The great domes sweeping up towards heaven. The beautiful image of Our Lady and Son, Michelangelo's Pietà mother and son at the most crucial point in Mary's life, holding the dead Jesus in her arms. Down the main aisle, up along the sides of the walls of St. Peter's are statues of saints who were involved with children and education. On the four corners of the main altar, there are statues of saints who had to do with our Lord's public ministry. Then we come to the tomb where our first Pope Peter is buried, above the place on the same hill where he was crucified upside down. Most of our popes have been buried here in the crypt of St. Peter's Basilica, beside their mentor and forefather, St. Peter. St. Pius X, whose body was as never decomposed, is up on the main altar. He wears a silver face mask. You can't help but be filled with the beauty and excitement that makes up our church. Our pilgrims come to celebrate Mass here at the birthplace of our Catholic Church. One of our groups is celebrating Mass in the Hungarian chapel in the lower level of St. Peter's. It is so awesome to be able to come here and be a part of that which makes our church great. Every Sunday, our Pope speaks to the faithful from a window here at the papal apartments. He gives them a talk, prays with them, and imparts his apostolic blessing. The only time the Pope is not here is during the summertime, when it gets too hot to stay in Rome. Then he goes to Castel Gandolfo, but every Sunday he comes out to the balcony and gives his blessing to the people. Amen. Because St. Peter's Basilica and Vatican City are such an important part of the history of our church, 
Most of the treasures of our church are kept in the Vatican Museum. All the miracles we speak about in our books and videos are documented on the walls and ceilings of the Vatican Museum. Here, on the way to the Sistine Chapel, we see the cave of St. Michael and the miracle there. The Holy House of Loreto, when Our Lady is transported. We see St. Anthony preaching to the fish when the others would not listen. We see here a, a, an incident where the angels are helping the saints. St. Francis of Assisi receiving the stigmata when everything was taken from him. History in the making. Here we are seeing what we've been gifted with, affirmations of the truths of our church being taught to us in art. All the things we believe in are painted here on the walls of the Vatican Museum. Everything leads to the Sistine Chapel. It's very important when you look at the Sistine Chapel at the Last Judgment, you become aware that this is no longer the Jesus of mercy. No longer our God of mercy, he is our God of justice. And we must realize that the time will come when justice will take over for mercy. But a younger Michelangelo painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel with life, excitement, and hope. In that, he painted the creation of the world. We also pay tribute to our first pope for whom the basilica has been named and dedicated, St. Peter, and his, yes, the crucifixion. St. John Lateran has been the Cathedral of Rome from the very beginning. And as such, it is the Church of the Bishop of Rome. Our Pope, John Paul II, is Bishop of Rome. And so this church, dedicated to Saints John the Baptist and John the Beloved, is considered the Church of our Pope. It's extremely important, this church because it was the church that was donated to our popes by the Emperor Constantine, the emperor who made Christianity a national religion in Rome, who broke the bonds of persecution and set the church free through the intercession of St. Michael the Archangel. Constantine had a vision before a battle where he saw St. Michael aiding him in winning the victory over his enemies. After the battle was over and he had been victorious, in thanksgiving, he converted to Christianity. He gave the church freedom in Rome, and later he made it the national religion of the country. From there, it became the official religion of the entire Roman world. St. John Lateran, in its original form, is the oldest church in Rome. The land was donated by the Lateran family and the cathedral is located on the Lateran Hill, thus the name St. John in Lateran. It was the first church founded by Constantine after Christianity was accepted in Rome. We go from St. John Lateran to St. Mary Major, the largest and major church in honor of Our Lady, and the oldest church dedicated to Mary in Rome. There is a strong tradition as to how this church received its name. At the end of the fourth century, Pope Liberius asked Our Lady to tell him where the major church in honor of her should be built in Rome. On August the 5th, on this spot, which is called Esquiline Hill, it began to snow. A very fervent man had an apparition of Our Lady in which she told him to go to the Pope and tell them this was where she wanted the basilica to be built and that he was to use his funds to help the Pope build the church, which he did. The basilica has been revitalized over the centuries, but the symbol of Our Lady, the Queen of Peace, is so strong here. She has such a firm, protective grip on her child and on her church. There is a special chapel dedicated to Our Lady of the Snows. It's here that the miracle is depicted in which the snow fell on the 5th of August. Every year on this day, millions of white rose petals are taken up to the roof of the church and thrown down to the people as a reenactment of the miracle of the snow. 
There is a special icon of Our Lady, which is said to have great miraculous intercessory powers. And in the crypt of the church, there is a reliquary from the wood from the manger of Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. This is said to have been brought back by St. Helena, the mother of Constantine. A few years ago, Pope John Paul II asked the custodians of the three major basilicas, as well as the Cathedral of St. John Lateran, to have perpetual Eucharistic adoration. And so you will notice in every one of the major churches in Rome, the Blessed Sacrament is exposed every day, all day long, in one of the chapels. Our Pope is trying to impress on us the importance and the power of our Lord Jesus in the Eucharist. And isn't it fitting, in honor of Our Lady, that we would venerate and adore her Son, our Lord Jesus, in the Eucharist? We consider the Colosseum to be a part of pagan Rome, and indeed it is, but it has a great deal to do with our Christian heritage. Because it was here in this Colosseum that many of our Christian brothers and sisters gave their lives for the faith, for their Lord Jesus to fight paganism in Rome. I believe it's on Good Friday every year. It comes to the Colosseum and walks the way of the cross in honor of the martyrs who died. For many years, the, uh, the guides would insist that there were no Christian martyrs. This is the first year that we hear the guides admit, yes, Christians were martyred here for the faith. And I wonder, I wonder how many martyrs there are today. I wonder how many of us would be accused of being Christians if we too were put on trial. If we were accused of being Christians, would we plead guilty? Every year on Good Friday, Pope John Paul II comes to the Colosseum and walks the way of the cross in honor of those martyrs who died and gave their blood here. The little flower, Saint Therese, came here while on pilgrimage to Rome, jumped down and kissed the floor of the Colosseum. We go to the Basilica of St. Paul outside the wall. It was in this area that Paul gave up his life after having brought the Church of Christ to the Gentile world, first he brought it to the areas of Turkey, Greece, and Lower Asia. And then he came across to the province of Macedonia, down through Greece, Ephesus, Corinth, and finally into the eternal city of Rome. Paul is the the evangelist of the Church of the Gentiles. Without Paul, we really would not have had the Church of the Gentiles as we know it today. He was the one that the Lord gave the message to, you will go and preach to the Gentiles. And so he took the message literally. He went out and he evangelized the Church of the Gentiles and the church that we have today. The adventures of Paul uh, would read like a high adventure story because he was just so filled with the, uh, the desire to bring the Lord's word to the people of the world. He, he just went all over the place. And he finally ended up here. It was in this area that he was beheaded at the end of his life. Paul, I think Paul is exactly what we're talking about when we say holy, set aside, a contradiction in the world. Jesus took someone who was a persecutor of Christians, and not only did he blind him to everything he had ever known, but he gave him new light. And that new light was to bring that word to the rest of us, who at that time were in darkness. Paul, with that sword, was a light. Paul has influenced more people and brought more to Christianity, more than any man outside of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even this stubborn Saint Augustine, who read all the philosophers, who thought that scripture was too simple for him, came to the church through the writings of St. Paul. And you know, those writings sound very romantic when, when we read them. But the way to the resurrection for Paul was the way of the cross, just the way it was with Jesus. Paul used the means of communication in his day. If he were living in the 20th century, we could just visualize Paul with a portable computer on his back 
and a video camera running all over the area trying to evangelize to the Lord's people. The epistles of St. Paul were one of the first means where he broke through and was able to be in more than two places at once. The writings of St. Paul have influenced the major minds of our church today. Brilliant, beautiful writings of St. Paul. He's truly one of the greatest apostles that we've ever known. St. Paul wrote as a city boy, because that's what he was. Jesus wrote as a country boy. He wrote using all the nature, all the references that people understood, using sheep and goats and wheat and weeds. Paul said things like, I have run a good race. I have fought the good fight. And it's here that after the church became leg legitimate in the time of Constantine, the bones of St. Paul were brought back here and they were dedicated in this church. The tomb of St. Paul is here in this church. This is the Mamertine prison in Rome, where St. Paul spent his last days. Nero had burned down the city of Rome and needed somebody to blame, so he blamed the Christians. They went on a rampage, persecuting all the Christians, and they found Paul as being one of the heads of the Christians and put him into prison here. It's a dungeon. It's very dark and damp and dank downstairs, and if you could believe it, Paul wrote some of his most beautiful letters, the letters to the Philippians, here in this dungeon. You know, as we look around, and if you look around at the surrounding area here, what you see are ruins, ruins of a very proud civilization. And yet, this man who wrote letters, who was rejected, um, who was persecuted. By man's standard, he was a failure. He is remembered. He has touched the world and Christianity more than any person who ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. It's, it's such a paradox when you look around you here because everything is falling apart, and yet the words of the man who was held prisoner here are so alive and brand new today, 2,000 years later. So accountable, so touchable. He didn't write big uh, books. He didn't write uh, novels. He wrote letters, and they were letters of love. In researching Teresa of Avila, I did quite a bit of research on a contemporary of her time, which was Luther. And when Luther, Martin Luther got disillusioned, he spoke of the people as unruly, barbaric, uh, using the unkindest terms. But Paul, who most of the time was ignored, who uh, had to face the worst permissiveness of the Greeks and the Romans, always spoke with love. And not only that, Paul was never accepted, really accepted as one of the apostles. They always considered him a Johnny come lately. And yet this man Suspect. gave up his life for the faith. He gave up his life for Jesus. He said, I would not have um, backed off for anything except Jesus. I never would have backed off because of man, but because of Jesus, I would do anything he told me to do. And I had my pride and I had my commitment from Jesus himself. You know, he was a fighter and he was not someone to back down from a fight. But after he had a vision of heaven, his desire, his one desire on earth, was to be with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This was the last home of St. Paul. Quite unlike the first imprisonment where he had house arrest and he was free to have people come and he could speak to them and convert them, 
This is where he wound up. This is where the end of his life he stayed. It's hard to really visualize how bad it was at that time. There were no lights here. There, were no, there was no air. Here we have a fan that, that tries to suck out the dry air, but there was none of that during the time of Paul. And yet Paul wrote some of the most beautiful letters he had ever written here in the Mamertine prison. He wrote his last testimony, his letter to Timothy, where he said, I have run the good race, and he was ready to go. He was ready to go to the Father. At this point, Paul was old and tired. He was waiting to go back to the Father for his reward. And at one given point, he heard footsteps of soldiers above him on the street above, and they came down to get him. And he knew that this was his time to go to the Father. And they took him outside the city walls, as was his privilege as a Roman citizen, and they decapitated him. And thus ended, as far as they knew, Paul. But Paul has been with us for the last 2,000 years and will continue to stay with us as long as there is a church. Because the writings of St. Paul are some of the strongest writings we have ever had in the history of our church. We thank our Lord Jesus for the gift of St. Paul and we thank Paul for the work that he did to bring the church to the Gentiles, the church to Rome, and from Rome it spread out all over the world. The Scala Santa, the Holy Steps. Once a part of the papal palace of St. John Lateran, it is now across the street. These are the steps Jesus ascended at Antonius Fortress in Jerusalem. They were brought back to Rome. These are the steps Jesus walked when he was condemned to death by Pontius Pilate. Pilgrims travel up these steps on their knees. No one's allowed to walk up these steps. We're allowed to crawl on our knees, and at any given point, we bend down and kiss the steps that Jesus stepped on as he went up to be condemned to death. It can be such a contradiction when we're in Rome. We can be riding on tour buses, touring all over secular Rome. We come to this place and automatically go down on our knees to climb the steps. We visited the catacombs. This was our home before we became legitimate, when we were an underground church. We celebrated Mass here. We met as a community. We buried our dead here. There are tombs for infants, young people, families all over this area. The Via Appia Antica on the outskirts of Rome. The Romans would always honor a burial place. They knew the Christians were burying their dead here, but they would never molest or desecrate tombs. The gift of the catacombs was a gift we were given that nothing bad would ever happen here. The first feast of Saints Peter and Paul was celebrated down in the catacomb of Saint Sebastian. Here, we stand above the tombs of martyrs. It's a fitting tribute to ending our pilgrimage to Rome here at the catacombs. It is so exciting for us to have visited and shared with you this city of Rome. This holy city. You have been walking with us on holy ground. You know, when we come to the Colosseum, guides have always said to us, no Christians were martyred here. Well, it's very strange because there is a cross there. And the Christians were martyred there as well as in the uh, theater. Circus Maximus. Circus Maximus. You know, I was talking with Mother Angelica, and she spoke of signal grace. Mm -hmm. She said what the Christian martyrs had as they stood in that Colosseum and that theater and did not run away from these lions and leopards and tigers as they charged at them to rip them apart, they had signal grace. We went to the uh, catacomb of San Sebastian, and there we saw the tombs of St. Peter and Paul before they were brought back to the place where they are today. And they used to celebrate 
the feast of St. Peter and Paul in that place, these two giants of our church brought Christianity to the whole world through Rome, because Rome was the center of everything at that time. The way that we choose to find the center of things in our country and on our world to communicate to the rest of the world, they did it there. You know, as you've been traveling through Rome, I'm sure you have seen evidences of the pagan world still there. And yet, what is the Vatican? What is the Holy See? What is the Pope? That contradictory sign in the world. So nothing has changed. The paganism of Rome that was there during the uh, time of Peter and Paul is still there. And yet the church flourishes and still stands the ruins of a great civilization. This is something we really want you to concentrate on. And look at the ruins, because we're going to be showing you some of these ruins now. These ruins are 2,000 years old. At one time, they were the glory that is Rome. And today, they are nothing more than rubble. And yet, our church has survived the promise that Jesus gave us. The gates of hell will not prevail against you. I will be with you always until the end of time. Rome, when our Lord died, as he was preparing for his horrible death, he left us with a sweet Christ on earth. That's what St. Catherine called the Pope. And he placed Peter in Rome and asked him, no, he commanded him to remain there. And that father, that earthly father that we have, is there in Rome, but he doesn't stay confined there. There is an unbroken line of succession. And if you go inside, when you visit Rome, and you should visit Rome, go inside the church of St. Paul outside the wall, and you will see each and every pope that we have had in the history of our church. It is a proud heritage that we've got there, folks. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.